Ed Gerwitz grew up in New York. His wife, Maddie, is from a small town in Georgia. In 35 years of marriage, the couple has dealt with family issues, racial matters, and major social change. If we went down to Greenwich Village, there was no problem. People kind of look at you, but they didn't bother you or nothing. We went uptown to the east side, to the 80s, which today is probably a very avant-garde and you have a lot of interracial couples. In those days, no, you, you would get looks, you would get stares. Nobody ever said anything that I could recall, but I know certain places that were not happy if we showed up together to go into. Yeah. Uh, theaters and stuff, they kind of look at you as, you know, what, what are you doing away. here? Or walk away, you know, people would. And I know my, eventually my parents dropped some of their friends because they would not invite us to their house and they wouldn't invite my parents anymore to their house. Mm -hmm. From Maddie's side of the family, I never had any, any no problem. problems whatsoever. I think the cocoa butter was probably, the cocoa butter that the, the blacks use, and this is some, some colognes and stuff. I think it was more for me was dietary. I mean, some of the food. I don't eat pork. And my wife would, and I eat kosher meat only. So my wife would cook, you know, for me, the, the kosher stuff. And I got to eventually enjoy collard greens and stuff. I would never have eaten it before. And grits became a, a novelty uh, type of, uh, of food for me. How, how uh, receptive was your son when you first got married? Oh, he didn't want it at all. But then after he went on and he learned to love my husband very much, he called him Pop. I, I could still think and feel that, you know, somewhat was, how do you explain this man? And he would explain me as his stepfather was the easiest. My grandchildren, as far as I know, don't use that uh, term. And my great grandkids, well, the oldest one is, as they say, is Randy Six. I don't think he understands it. A family is someone that is close, that have love for one another, and will stand for you no matter what happened. My family is fairly small. I have one brother who lives in California. Uh, I have some cousins who I have not kept up with. For me, family is more on my wife's side, of, of quote, of the family. And I think historically, the, the, the black community has always had an extended concept of family. So, and I kind of fit into that very nicely with my, maybe my personality or just what I, I like in things. But there's certain so. cultural differences, I think, that are out there. But I think once you're submerged in, in another person's culture, they don't become prevalent or they don't mean anything uh, eventually. Yeah. The only thing I can give advice to uh, the, uh, other, other couples is don't let exterior pressures interfere with what you're doing. I mean, who you snore next to is your business. Not mommies, not papas, not the three neighbors that don't want to talk to you anymore. That's none of their business. It's, it's your decision, it's your, it's your thing, you know. Because you love one another, that's the yeah. main thing, is so. the love. And to be together with one another. Yeah. Greg Hart and Clift August have a non-traditional relationship which crosses racial and generational lines. The Hollywood Center for Positive Living and their business ventures provide them with a supportive community, but learning how to deal with differences has been a common thread in both of their backgrounds. If you're living in a small town in Vermont, it's, uh, it's probably not so easy to express yourself. Uh, uh, especially when you're you're known within the entire community for you know your family for generations. So, uh, Washington D.C. and Boston were the years where I came out and I was exposed to everything. I guess I actually grew up in a, a three red light town. It's called Kendall, Louisiana. There I experienced uh, uh, interracial uh, dating, and <clears throat> I didn't I didn't see it at, I didn't see it as an issue until I noticed. Um, what I deemed as my friends uh, basically making their points known. I can't say that in meeting Cliff uh, that that difference has been significant. Um, maybe because when I met him it, I, it was a certain point in my life where uh, I'm a very strong person and I don't have a lot of people in my world that are going to uh, uh, at this point in my life, approve or disapprove of what I do and what I choose. My uh, sexual orientation and uh, all of that doesn't really have any bearing on my work. Uh, the social circles I travel in are people who are pretty um, evolved in terms of their understanding. Between Greg and myself, uh, 
I haven't noticed um, a uh, I haven't noticed a, a breakdown in communication just due to our skin color. I would think where, where, where it may come up, um, and we definitely don't hear about it, uh, would, would probably be along the lines of, of, of parenting, you know, or the parents. Not, and, and not so much as, you know, Cliff, this is, you know, this is black and this is white, but, you know, Cliff, what, what about, um, what, how's things going in the relationship? Is the communication going okay? Because in their minds, they may, they may believe in, on some level that, um, there should be some sort of, of difference in communication, whether that be uh, race or, or, or even age for that matter. There's a challenge sometimes in communication because uh, I can listen to his music. That's enough just right there. <laughs> I'll get into the car and I'll say, oh my God. <laughs> if anything, that's been our challenge is to uh, find common ground to talk about and resolve. And, We've been pretty successful that way, uh, so that, that's that's the that that's probably been the key issue to work through more than anything racial. Social activism in college brought Isaac and Rama Carter together. However, negotiating the more subtle aspects of their African American and East Indian cultures in their daily lives has proven to be a lot more challenging than they expected. I have to admit that nothing's been told to me directly. It's been in more indirect, subtle ways. Um, more like, wow, you know, you really ventured back to Africa. You know, things like that. Um, wow, you really took a risk. Uh, not much about, you know, Isaac or just, you know, insinuating that you really either crossed the line or um, are willing to deal with something that can be very difficult in a cultural context. Um, Going to weddings, very, very difficult for us. When he's in um, my cultural context, he's, he's, he's welcomed, you know, first and foremost, they'll say, you know, hello, you know, I am so-and-so, good to meet you, Isaac, and then that's about it. They don't, they don't welcome him any more than that. Um, he, he often tells me that he feels invisible. He doesn't feel included. People tend to, even though they speak English, they tend to, uh, go back into their native language as, you know, you're the other, we speak this language. Um, whether it's conscious or unconscious, I don't know, but it happens all the time. Whether it's in the family context, or in the wedding, in the extended family, or even amongst friends. I think you got to come to terms to a certain degree, and then on my, on my side of it, I, I think it's a challenge when you, in a black community that's traditionally Christian, the thing we get, I guess, brought the most is, well, she's Hindu. So what does that mean? <laughs> and what is what is Kushi gonna be? You know, and that's our son. So it it's and it's all, and it's done, you know, in a way that makes you really wonder: is it really a big issue for your relationship, or is it really their issue? I think the more we talk about it and experience it, it's more other people's issue. Because we don't really argue about it or discuss it, it's not until someone brings it up and then one of us is feeling targeted then it becomes a discussion item. I may come up with jokes, but, <laughs> but other than that, it doesn't come up. I think my family is, has tried to do what, you know, someone say traditional black families may do in terms of being open and welcoming to, I'm the oldest child, I'm the first, first born, and, and they were all excited about me getting married so they're very accepting but then there's limits to the, the to the exception in terms of sometimes I feel they want her to conform to our cultural norms and it's a constant negotiation of give and take a try to say what norms you want to conform with and what norms you don't want to because I had to do the same thing on my side what what things do I want on her side what do I want to make an issue of and what do I just say yeah no big deal it's just for a few hours or for a couple of days. It's not really going to be the end all be all. They're in other locations. Far. Far, far away. More when there's a concentration <laughs> of one culture, then the norms tend to swing toward the dominant, whatever the group that has the most numbers. And that's where you see <laughs> the issues come up. After we've been with family, either my family or his, we usually, not even usually, we have to come home and we have to talk. There's always an issue that comes out from there, whether it be diet, 
to religion, to cultural beliefs and values. We always have to come home and, and parenting. Parenting is a huge one. I don't know why I didn't think about that. Um, and we always have to come home and renegotiate because we've either felt targeted and, and, and you know, want to make it um, something that's more defined because maybe we didn't think about it. Um, or we want to have a conversation so that the next time we go out there, we're more of a united front than, you know, feeling divided. You have to map out a strategy for how to deal with your family. So when they say this, you have to say this. You got to do like preemptive, the phone call. So when we come home, we don't want to talk about these things anymore. That's a non-discussion item. I've had to call home and say, that's not a discussion item anymore. Okay. Like religion. Yeah. It, whereas my family it grew, up, it grew up Christian, Rama becoming Christian or question Hindu is a non-discussion item. But I had to call to say that because I thought it would naturally occur, but it didn't naturally occur. <laughs> so you have to make a strategy, make a point of bringing up something that never really occurs to us because it's not. It's funny, I wasn't that when you raise Christian, you think about, you know, God, some simple kind of commandments. <laughs> Love everybody, treat everybody like you want to be treated. I don't know what the complication is. For Isaac, it's mostly diet. You know, he, he comes from a family that, you know, has their, their cultural food. And, and we are, you know, have been vegetarian for generations. And we don't understand eating meat. At least my, my parents don't, and it's always an issue. Isaac, you should eat more vegetables each time. Isaac, you should eat more vegetables. Are you eating more vegetables? Rama, is he? Is he? And it's sort of this, you know, you think it, it, it's such a you know, small thing, but it, it becomes bigger and bigger, and it becomes annoying. I would say that, that it was more Isaac's values and beliefs and, and politics that, that attracted me as opposed to his, his, um, his race. After having come from Africa, I didn't really have a lot of contact um, with the black community. I was in a predominantly Latin American, Filipino community. So Isaac was, you know, not a, his cultural background wasn't a background that I was familiar with at all. I've done a lot of learning and, and the learning curve has been really steep.